Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about um, um, stuff that I should have talked about last time. But I'm going to uh, try not to spend too much time on that so I can get to new stuff that I want to talk about for this time. Um, but there's a lot of stuff I didn't get to last time, so it's going to be like half and half, I hope. Um, so, um, well, when I say I didn't get to it, I mean I kind of rushed through it at the end, so now I want to talk about it in more detail. So, there's two um, basic things that the constructional system is supposed to supposed to be doing here. Um, and I'm going to emphasize that there are two different things because, as I think I said before, in later Carnap, the two things are going to come apart and different parts of a system are going to do one and the other parts going to do the other. So the first one is what's done by any constructional system whatsoever. Um, is that it's supposed to show the unity of science or the unity of the object domain, right? That is, it's supposed to show that all the objects that are discussed in science, that claims are made about in science, um, they all fall into um, a single system and they can be regarded as all statements about a certain single type of basic object. Um, now, in this context, before adding the thing about epistemic primacy, we already have a question, namely, so what are all the objects that are discussed by science? Um, or that is, what does science mean here? Um, does this leave out some other types of object that are not discussed by science? So I think, um, Basically, what science means at this stage is um, a certain responsible way of thinking, of speaking. Um, we haven't, the epistemic primacy thing is supposed to explain more what that responsibility is, what it's a responsibility to, but, um, but what we know here is that science in, is everything that's spoken in that responsible spirit. So the objects of science are everything that are or can be spoken about in that responsible spirit. Now, so how do we know which objects those are? Because like I said, it's the epistemic primacy thing that's supposed to explain in more detail what that responsibility amounts to. Um, but here we're just talking about constructional systems in general. And, um, and I guess it's important to realize that already in the Aufbau, Carnap thinks there's something valuable about constructional theory in general that what he's doing in this book is just an example of, even though it's a really important example. It's not a random example. But um, so what does it mean to say that uh, like no matter what constructional theory we choose, it should be such that it can unify all the objects of science. How are we going to know what the objects of science are when we haven't yet explained what that responsibility is that marks out science? Um, 
And the answer is, so, and by the way, the, um, this is a type of problem that a lot of different kinds of philosophy of science will have. Right, they want to say something about the objects of science in general or about scientific speech or scientific method. But the question is, um, how do you know in advance what that is? So, I mean, we know from the preface that Carnap, so like one type of answer might be, well, uh, I'm setting up the standards for what's gonna count as science now. And whoever listens to me will count as science. But we know that that's not what Carnap thinks. I mean, um, we know basically, like based on the explanation I gave to begin with of why there is such a thing as philosophy of science, we know that in general, that's not what philosopher of science, philosophers of science are gonna wanna say, right? Because the basic situation here is, um, not that philosophers are trying to found science, which they hope will be really successful, but rather that philosophers have noticed that there's this thing, modern science, that's really successful, but they don't understand what it is. <laughs> and it seems to be different from philosophy, at least from philosophy that's traditionally been done. So, um, so that answer where it's like, well, I don't care what, people call, have called science before this. I'm just, I'm setting down the rules and what I say goes is not gonna be an attractive type of answer. And we know from the preface that it's not Carnap's answer, right? When he steps back and, and speaks outside the framework of his system and it tries to explain why he's setting it up, he describes just the kind of situation I'm talking about, right? There's a group of philosophers who have um, attach themselves to science because they find the way scientists do things so attractive and they're trying to be responsible the way the scientists are. So we already know in advance what, at least roughly speaking, what is going to count as science, or at least we know some good examples of it. Um, and so, I mean, uh, this is important for understanding the whole project of the Aufbau. And I, um, I said it last time, but I'm gonna try to say it more carefully this time. Um, so first of all, here is from section 102 on page 160. The constructional system is a rational reconstruction of a process of cognition whose results are already known. Right? We already know. We're not trying to find out, like for the first time, what are the things that science discusses. We already know what the things science discusses are, and we're trying to get them into our system. That's the project. And for that reason, so this is going back to section 17 on page 31. Um, it starts here. When, later on, we give a presentation of construction theory, we shall not presuppose any of the factual results and problems of the present chapter. Okay, so the present chapter, that's the one where he gave an overview of the different object types. There are physical objects, there are psychological objects, etc. It says when we start doing the constructional system, we're not going to presuppose any of this. So what's the point of introducing it here then? 
like shouldn't you just forget it as much as possible and just try to set up the constructional system and see what comes out but no that's not at all what he would want to do um, this is the use of the factual results we've discussed here they will become the most important test when we judge our final result right that is the test of whether the constructional system worked is whether it found a place for all these uh, types of object that we discussed in our initial overview. Um, so, I mean, that also means, by the way, that everything that Carnap says that's kind of interesting in that section, in that chapter about like, cultural objects and how they manifest themselves and so on and so forth. That's not actually supposed to be original. That's right. The, the point is to give a catalog of what we already think the objects type types that are discussed in science are. So it's not supposed to be original and it's supposed to be, you know, like for example, the stuff about cultural objects, he refers to Diltai Herman, is that his first name? Diltai? They're all named Herman or something like that. <laughs> anyway, um, right, a, an influential, uh, very late 19th, early 20th century philosopher who, um, whose whole point was to explain, you know, the special role for the cultural or spiritual geistish sciences like what we would call the social sciences and humanities that they really are, are taking on a different kind of problem than the physical or biological sciences and so forth so basically in passing he refers to diltai as the person who you know discovered or emphasized this these characteristics of cultural objects that's not to say, I mean, there may actually be some interesting original things in that chapter, but that's not the, that's not what it's supposed to be for. Um, okay, so we're not establishing these factual results about what types of objects there are and what types of properties they have, and importantly, how they're related to each other. That is, like, for example, which could be reduced to which? What kind of indicators do they have? We're not establishing that. Who is supposed to establish that? The answer is that science is supposed to establish that. Or as he sometimes says, the special sciences, right? The special sciences means as opposed to philosophy as the general science or something like that. Right, so traditionally, like the special sciences, would be opposed to metaphysics. Sometimes nowadays, you hear the special sciences opposed to physics, right? Because physics is the uni the general, universal science. Um, in this case, the special sciences are opposed to basically construction theory, what philosophy is supposed to do according to current. And it means all the empirical sciences, right? So the empirical sciences are supposed to tell us what types of objects there are and how they're related to each other. Um, and then uh, philosophy in the form of construction theory is going to come along after the fact, right? As Hegel says, the owl of Minerva spreads its wings at dusk. <laughs> <laughs> Hegel's not the only one who thinks that about philosophy. A lot of philosophers think something like that, including me, I guess. So anyway, um, philosophy in the form of constructional theory comes along after the fact and reconstructs what um, the scientists have already uh, determined in a preliminary way or something like that. In a way, in what sense is it preliminary? In a way that doesn't display its justification on the surface, its, its unity and justification on the surface. Um, so, and so, and this is a test for philosophy. When you finish the philosophical task, you go back to the results of the empirical sciences 
Now, I mean, you might ask, just the empirical sciences, what about kind of everyday common sense knowledge? And the answer is that Carnap doesn't make a strict distinction between those two. He, again, like many philosophers, tends to think of empirical science as an extension of the more reasonable ways we act and, and discover things in everyday life, right? So in other words, there's a table here is gonna count as somewhere in there as basically a scientific statement from Carnap's point of view. So all of those things, there's a table here, electrons exist, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all have to get in as parts of the system, as meaningful, not excluded as mere metaphysics, um, and also another part of the test that he doesn't emphasize as much, but it's at least as important to him, everything that is mere metaphysics has to be left out. <laughs> right. So, um, and this is such a serious test that basically one of the ways to understand what happens in Carnap's later development and the later development of logical positivism in general is that, um, they find it difficult to draw that line in the right place. So they find um, using various attempts, beginning with the Aufbau, that it seems like either they have to um, exclude certain things that you want to count as science, but they turn out to be metaphysics on this view, um, or that um, when they, you know, liberalize the criteria enough to get those things in, they find that they've included other stuff that they really didn't want to count as part of science. Um, and like I said, you can see it's a serious test because they take it seriously as they go on, right? So Carnap will change his view in order to try to get, for example, a statement like sugar is soluble. That's one of the first type of problems that comes up. To get a statement like sugar is soluble into the system somewhere. Why is it hard to get a statement like sugar is soluble into the system? Well, we'll see in probably more detail than you want to know, but basically it's because sugar is uh, some sugar, every piece of sugar is soluble, even if it's never ever put in water. So it shows no empirical sign of being soluble. <laughs> Right, so the question is, how does that count as an empirical statement? All right, so anyway, but then there turn out to be a lot more problems. Um, okay, are there questions about that so far? Okay, so, um, So that objects fall into this unified system means, according to construction theory, that each object falls into a definite type in Russell's sense of type. So each object, so it's like someone was asking me about this during my office hours. So I think, um, you know, to give an example, we were talking about the example of circle. That's a little confusing because it's a mathematical object, but, you know, talk about the, object human, what does it mean to say that human or humans have to fit into the system at a certain level? Well, it means that at, cert at a certain level, we're going to introduce this symbol as the name of a class. Right? And that means that it's going to occur in the context of statements like that, X member of human, which we read as X is human. Well, I mean, should we read that as X is human? No, I guess we should say X is a member of the class of humans. The property of being human belongs to X, right? And then the, um, the idea is going to be to interpret this class as the extension of some predicate. Um, in general, it will be a many place relation well, I don't think it should be text form. This is what I meant. No, okay. No, this is how I should write it. 
So it's it's gonna be um, um, some predicate that applies to the type of things that could be members of this, whatever they are. Right? Those are things at a lower level in the system by definition. Right? The whole point of the theory of types is that classes only contain members of lower levels. So when I ask whether something is a human, I'm asking about something on a lower level of the system, whether it's a member of this class. And if I can figure out what this predicate is, and it's going to be very complicated, uh, well, I mean, it might not be complicated depending on what the next level, lo, lower level down is. Like maybe the next lower level down already contains objects like animals, feet, toenails, <laughs> um, and predicates like, uh, you know, is bipedal and whatever. So that, you know, that maybe this will end up just being like featherless biped with toenails. Or something like that. You have to add toenails to, to exclude chickens, pluck chickens. All right. Anyway, uh, right. So so that means that then everywhere that every statement involving the name of this class human will be able to be translated into a statement that contains instead some something about the type of things that could be humans like animals or whatever, and it will say something about them, um, and the, the predicate human will be eliminated. Okay, and f if the system is set up correctly, everything will feature on exactly one level. That's necessary for, for the theory of types to work. You can't have human also occurring at lower levels. Then you would get the Russell paradox again. Um, so um, you know that's enforced by the idea that the the place of a argument place of a propositional function um, um, I'm not explaining this very well, am I? Times. You know what, let me not get into that again. I've talked about it before. Unless, is there a question about that? The, I guess the main point is, maybe I didn't explain that well how it's explained, to, how it's connected to the theory of types, but just take my word for it. The theory of types requires that the argu argument place of a certain propositional function can only take objects of one type. It can't, right, there's no, things that you can say about objects of one type, or you can also say exactly the same thing about objects of another type. And that, right, so, right, here's how to explain it, because if that weren't the case, then the extension of this propositional function would be um, a class that doesn't occur at just one level in the system. It has members of different types, right? So this has to take objects of only one type, and that's why Carnap, when he introduces this term is isogeneity, in, in German he actually says Sphärenverwandtschaft, sphere uh, related, relatedness in the sense of like, yeah, belonging to the same sphere, sphere, having a sphere in common. That's not a precise translation, but anyway, so belonging to the same object sphere, to the same type. Um, you can test whether things belong to the same type by seeing whether you can say the same things about them, right? So like you can say, um, um, this pen is in my hand. You can't say aluminum is in my hand. But you can say a piece of aluminum is in my hand. You can't say aluminum is in my hand. And that shows that pen, this pen and aluminum belong to different object types. Um, the problem is that uh, that test doesn't work very well with ordinary language. Because, for example, I can say this pen is purple. 
Again, it looks blue on the screen for some reason, but it's purple. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's true or false anyway. I can say this pen is purple. I can say aluminum is purple. Aluminum is purple is false, but it makes perfect sense, right? It's just, that's not what color it is. It's kind of grayish. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so it seems like there's some things you can say about both of them. And that's why Carnap introduces this idea of um, type ambiguity, that the terms of ordinary or um, it doesn't really say ordinary, it says customary. The terms of our customary or traditional language don't always distinguish properly between types. So we use the same word purple to mean two different things. One is a property that a physical substance like aluminum can have, not in the technical philosophical sense of substance, but the usual sense of substance. <laughs> um, whereas the other is a property that an individual physical body like this pen can have, and they're not the same property. In fact, not only aren't the same, they aren't the same property, they're not properties in the same sense of property, right? They belong to completely different levels in the type system. But we use the same word purple for both because it's convenient. Um, right? Like basically if I say aluminum is purple, what I mean, it's equivalent to saying that any physical object made entirely out of aluminum and not painted, etc., is purple. <laughs> right? So rather than say all of that, I just say aluminum is purple. I use the same word twice and it doesn't usually get us confused. But Carnap says when we start to do philosophy, it does get us confused, and that's a main source of philosophical error. Okay, are there questions about that? Because I only want to talk about the stuff that I missed on last week for about 15 more minutes. Okay, so. So this is about constructional systems in general. Now, what's going to be special about the constructional system of this book is it's, it's going to be a constructional system that um, respects epistemic priority or primacy. I think actually priority might have been a better translation than primacy, but it says primacy, so I'll go with that. So it respects epistemic primacy, um, meaning that um, the higher level objects are going to be objects that we know on the basis of our knowledge of the lower level objects. We know the lower level objects first, so to speak. Right? I mean, I don't think... Um, I mean, I know Carnap, Carnap says explicitly that first there is not a um, temporal priority, right? He says, we always find in ourselves an experience already um, encountering higher level objects. And it actually takes a lot of um, careful work to determine what are the epistemically primary uh, objects, you know, on the basis of which we know those everyday objects that we always deal with, like tables and so forth. Um, so it's not temporal priority, but it's a uh, priority of justification, I think. Rational justification. my claim to know something about objects like table rests on the fact that I can sense them. Right? I don't, since I'm not normally asked to explicitly back up that claim, that doesn't usually come up. Um, and I usually just go around thinking about tables and pens and whatever. Um, and Carnap says scientists do the same thing, right? Like biologists 
you know, out in the field uh, collecting samples from pine trees or whatever. They don't, you know, they know what pine trees look like. They don't stop every time to, you know, um, Well, what they would really have to do is have the type specimen from the museum with them and compare it. But never mind that. So that, like, you know, that <laughs> the, they don't stop every time to make sure that the leaves look exactly right or whatever the official indicators are, right? They just look at it. Um, but nevertheless, if they're challenged and you say, well, how do you know that's a pine tree? So, you know... Um, they should be able to on the spot, or if they can't on the spot, they will have to, to satisfy you, go back and explain how they can tell the difference. That's the idea. Um, so, Right, so there's a difference between um, what sometimes, I don't think Kurnak uses this phrase in alpha, I don't remember, but it, it definitely gets used a lot later. Context of discovery versus context of justification. And he mentioned this contrast already in the preface, though again, I he does use the term justification there. I don't think he says discovery, but maybe he does. Um, that he mentions already in the preface that they, it's not that scientists always go around um, having perfectly well-defined terms and justifying everything they say based on you know, a whole chain of epistemic primacy going back to the primitive given or something like that. On the contrary, scientists like the rest of us go around recognizing what's happening in their lab, through their telescope, in the field, whatever, um, in an intuitive way. Right, this is Carnap's, it's not unique to him, but it's a particular use of the term intuitive, and it means basically that you recognize what something is um, and or what properties it has without going through the justification for it, just on the spot immediately. But in the context of justification, if someone asks you, well, how do you know then you have to give this. And this is what Carnap calls rational reconstruction. It's rational reconstruction. It's a reconstruction, meaning it's I don't go back and like introspect to determine how I actually recognized it. Right? Like I don't think about, you know, okay, what was it that caught my attention there or something like that. What I do is give things that I could have used, that I knew that I could have used to recognize it unequivocally. So, um, and this is what Carnap calls the indicators, right? I give some necessary and sufficient conditions for there to be such a thing there, like a table or a pine tree or whatever, and the necessary and sufficient conditions have to be things that are better known to me than whether it's a table or whether it's a pine tree. That is, they have to be epistemically primary. So you ask me, how do you know it's a table? And I say, well, I see it or something like that, you know, but it, it better be more complicated if I'm really going to justify it, right? This is what I see. I see colors. I feel this in a certain shape and a certain, etc. Um, 
I don't have to say everything that I see and feel. I don't have to say what I actually saw and felt in the instant when I said it was a table. I just have to say some things that I saw and felt or could have seen and felt at that moment that would have been necessary and sufficient for it to be a table. Um, Okay, are there questions about that? I wish there were some questions because I feel like what I'm saying is not necessarily easy to understand, but um, it may be that it's so hard to understand. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Does it matter if I saw someone else use the object as a table? Because it seems like it was based on personal experiences. Well, yeah, so um, so first of all, I don't think this is what you meant to ask, but it's related to what to to what you asked, which is that you might think that a table is a cultural object, that it belongs in a very high level of the constructional system, that it's not a physical object like a rock or something or a piece of aluminum because to be a table means to be used by a certain society as a table for a certain kind of purpose, right? So really it has to be reduced, first of all, to psychological entities, right? Like intentions, um, you know, so in general, in this group of people, they intend to use this to put things on, to, you know, whatever we use tables for exactly. And then, uh, no, I do not want to update Flash Player right now. No. Okay, and um, uh, and then those in turn would have to be reduced to behavioral statements about living things, human beings, and then those in turn would have to be reduced to physical statements about per perceivable objects. You know, so. Um, so, so yeah, at one stage in that, the indicator would be something like, I see people using it the way they would use a table. Or I see people, you know, it's probably more complicated than that. I see people treating things just like this that look like it, that were made the way it was made, etc., as a table. And even though this one hasn't, been used yet, I can still, you know, bring it under the cultural object table for that reason, right? So that would be the manifestation relation of that cultural object, basically. Um, most of the time, um, and, you know, he has this in common with a lot of philosophers before and after him who who know better officially, but it's just too much of a hassle to go into it. Most of the time, Carnap uses examples like table and house and pen as if they were purely physical things like, you know, this red sphere. All right. So and from that point of view, you know, is the fact that, you know, the fact that someone's using it as a table might be an indicator, meaning here, meaning not anything psychological or even biological, but that I see a certain type of thing adjacent to it in a certain type of way, you know, I mean, that's neither necessary nor sufficient for something to be a table, but maybe in some complicated way it can be involved in the description. Does that, I feel like maybe I didn't answer the question because I didn't answer the last part. It seems like it's based on personal experiences, meaning you're saying, well, it might, maybe it doesn't look to me like a table, but it looks to them like a table. Um, I mean, if it means it doesn't look to me like a table because I can't see it, but they can, then that's an example of something that Carnap goes into at a higher level of the system, and he alludes to in the reading for today, about kind of going back and correcting the perceptual physical thing world by including more objects based on the experiences of others, 
that, that have been constructed at, at the heteropsychological level, right? So I now kind of go back and add more objects, the objects that I can't see but other people can. That is, I fill in more colored points in space based on the way the other people's actions and reports and so forth. So if that's what it means, that's where that would fit in. So it's true that the auto psychological level is kind of unfinished. It really only can include things that look or that somehow seem to me like tables. Um, yeah, I mean, if it means that I see it, but it doesn't look to me like a table, but from this, I see from the way um, they're using it, that it looks to them like a table. Then that goes again through that cultural object thing, right? You know, I encounter members of a foreign culture. This is the type of example that Wittgenstein will um, take off on and uses a weapon partly against Carnap's way of thinking in the investigations, right? But I, I encounter a foreign culture, which is often described as a completely foreign culture, which is often described as a tribe, right? Why does it have to be a tribe? Because we're the universal culture. <laughs> Anyone who's foreign is just a tribe. Not that Wittgenstein says that, but apparently that's going on, right? But anyway, sorry, I'm gonna, that's, a, that's a huge digression. The point is, right, so I encounter someone from a very alien culture and I see them using some item that I wouldn't use as a table, but I see that they eat on it and they place their things on it when they're not using them and so, and, you know, so on and so forth. And I say, well, to them, it's a table. That would be an example of constructing table as a cultural object and using their intentions um, as manifested by their actions and reports to construct this as a table. Okay, that was a good question. I seem to have, hold on a second. Are you streaming or something? No, actually that wouldn't do it. It's on my computer, Never mind. I think the video gets jerkier when other processes start using too much time. All right, anyway. Um, okay, so I said I would only spend 15 minutes on this, so therefore there's a bunch more to say, but I just want to summarize what's important in it, which is that um, um, again, who is going to tell us what indicators there are of what objects? Who is going to tell us what things are better known to beings like ourselves such that we would have to base other claims uh, about other things on those and not vice versa? Who's going to tell us ultimately what the primitive given is, right? Like what is it that we're... Um, justified in talking about without any further justification. Um, and Carnap answers all of that empirical science. So even when he decides what the, the, the basic objects in this epistemically ordered system are going to be, he says, recent research in psychology has shown that Right, and then from that he, I mean, I am going to talk about that and more exactly what those are, but, you know, his research, research, research in psychology has shown that it's not actually atomistic things like color red here now, but it's holistic unified experiences. That's the ultimate given. But if further research in psychology showed that that's not really right, then the implication is Carnap would readjust his system. So this system can't be used to police science, right? It can't be used to take things that scientists are doing and saying, well, that's not scientific because you haven't used the right indicators or whatever. 
because at least as far as science as a whole goes, we're going to take science's word for it. That's how we started out, after all. Again, philosophers looking at science and saying, wow, this seems to be working really well. <laughs> um, so we're not going to turn around, for the most part, anyway. I mean, if we, we might find inconsistencies and point them out, right? But for the most part, we're not going to turn around and say, I'm sorry, what you're doing is not science. Um, all right, I've gone two minutes over what I said for myself, but I want to say one more thing, which is um, this has a kind of outcome. This is, again, this is serious, right? It's not just like he's saying that. It's actually true that he's not very critical of what is science and what isn't. And logical positives in general have this characteristic. And if you look at the examples of what counts as, psycho as science, he's happy to include psychoanalysis, graphology, right, that is handwriting analysis. Um, uh, he um, uses as examples of legitimate scientific concepts the names of races, right, like Negro and Mongolian. I don't, nothing I know about Carnap tells me or even makes me think it's possible that he was uh, racist in the sense of thinking some races are superior to others. But he doesn't have the resources to say race is just not a good scientific concept. He has to take, you know, if biologists are using it, he has no way of saying who are the real biologists and who aren't. He takes their word for it and tries to construct it in the system. Okay, that is where I'm really going to stop with the stuff I should have talked about last time. Although, actually, not quite that, because I should ask again if there are any questions before I go on. Okay, so... Um, The new uh, reading is, hold on, low battery. All right. Okay. Um, so the new material um, is introduces three new topics, but I think um, this time I'm going to try to get as far as I can with the first topic, and then the other two we're going to have more to address them next time. So the three new topics are, number one, the details of this constructional system. Not all the details. In fact, you probably noticed if you did the reading that I told you to skip most of the, the details of the constructional system, including the whole part where he does it mathematically, you know, using logical symbolism the way he says he sh he, you should do all of it, right? I didn't put any of that in the reading. Of course, you're, you're welcome to read it, um, more than welcome to read it, but... Uh, um, I'll say something about why it's not that important maybe. Uh, so number two is um, objections to this which are dismissed as metaphysical. Right? All kinds of things that people will say about this system once they hear the details that Carnap will say, well, actually, the question you're asking, the explanation you're asking for, the thing you think is missing, whatever, um, finds no place in scientific use of language. And number three, I'm not sure if this is exactly the right way to describe it, but 
Carnap's scientism, right? Scientism is um, used in philosophy. I guess it's usually used as a pejorative term, actually. Um, but, you know, it, it means basically thinking that uh, everything should be like science or something like that. Um, so Carnap is very scientistic. <laughs> is the adjective that goes with this, is very scientistic in um, in some ways and completely not in other ways. And he, and, and he addresses carefully in what sense he is and what sense he isn't. But again, he's going to address that more carefully in the reading for next time. So I'm going to mostly put off discussing that. So I'm going to get into this issue here, like what actually happens in the system and you know what happens in the part of the reading I assigned, but of course I assigned that part of the reading because I think those are the most important things that happen for the purpose of the course. Um, so the first thing is, um, what is the basis? And the answer is um, that it's what Carnap tells that is what he calls in English basic experiences. In German, they're called elementare Erlebnisse. <laughs> um, Erlebnis is one of the German words that can be translated as experience. So it's elementary experiences. Um, um, so, um, what are these? Um, kind of already explained, but I guess it's worth saying a little bit more about it, that um, number one, uh, the things we would normally think of as, as sense data are supposed to be abstractions from these elementar erlebnisse. Right, so abstraction, people have had me in any other course have probably already heard me talk about what abstraction um, properly speaking means, um, and Carnap is using it here in the proper way. You know, abstraction is kind of like subtraction. It's basically the same word as subtraction. <laughs> um, so uh, abstraction means that you have a concrete whole, but you take just part of it off and consider it by itself. So the elementar or labels are thought of as concrete holes of, um, everything that I'm experiencing at a certain time. Um, everything that, in a, in a broad sense, right, including thoughts and, and, and like feelings and the sense, like emotions um, and all sense modalities, all put together in one thing, and that's the elementar erlebnisse. So that's, that's an elementar erlebnisse. And, um, and Carnap's claim is, and again, he's not claiming this on his, as his own thesis, but he's saying that recent psychology, basically Gestalt psychology, has discovered this, that um, this is what's epistemically primary. So we first experience the whole, and then only by abstraction from the whole do we experience such things as individual sense data, uh, emotions, etc. Or only as on the the base of abstraction, do we, do we know, do we recognize those things? So how can we recognize those things based on, that is, what can the indicators be like? So the answer is, um, and this is, you know, there's a section that I wrote in my notes last year that I should assign this year, but I didn't, I forgot to change the syllabus, section 75 on the fundamental relations. Um, you can read it if you have extra time, you're interested. Um, basically, like 
you couldn't do this at all if all you had was the elementar erlebnisse, right? How am I supposed to start constructing anything based on that? And what is the indicator going to be? Right? All I know about them is that they are elementar erlebnisse. <laughs> So that's not an indicator for anything else. So in addition to basic objects, the system needs fundamental classes or relations that are not constructed, that are built in to begin with. And um, Carnap, Carnap's thesis is that he can do it with just one. And the relation, this does get mentioned a few times in the reading. In, uh, in English, they call it RS. RS stands for remembered similarity. So the relation that we know between elementar erlebnisse, that, that, that's part of the primary, epistemically primary givenness of everything, is that this one is, I remember that this one was similar to this one. Right, so again, this is a two-place predicate. It's a propositional function. It takes objects of the lowest level of the system, that is elementar erlebnisse, as it's um, in both of its argument positions. And, um, and it says about them, um, that is, it's intended to mean what we mean in ordinary language by saying that a, that one complete holistic experience is remembered to be similar somehow or other to a previous one. Anyway, whatsoever, right? So all we get to begin with is, so to speak, a list of ordered pairs of, and so, by the way, notice this is not a symmetric relation. You can't, if A bears this relation to B, then B does not bear the relation to A. Because, but actually in the constructional system, it's gonna work the other way around. The time order is gonna be constructed using this property of rec remembered similarity. Because if B is remembered to be similar to A, that means A comes after B in time and not vice versa. Right, so we end up with this with these ordered pairs of elementar erlebnisse, where the first one comes after the second one in time and is similar to it somehow or other, and then we use that one thing as the indicator that's going to allow us to build up to classes like um, the name of the class is going to be something like contains a red sensation, right? And we're going to want to be able to write this elementar elemis as a member of the class contains a red sensation. <laughs> and red sensation is going to end up meaning this class will be eliminable in favor of just things that contain elementar erlebnisse and remembered similarity. Okay, that sounds like it might be really hard, um, but that's actually the part of the system that Carnap claims to carry out in full rigor in those early sections, right, using the logistic symbolism. It turns out that uh, there are already technical errors at that stage. Um, it, was, it was pointed out pretty early on by Nelson Goodman, I think was the one, we're gonna be reading some stuff by Nelson Goodman later. I think it was pointed out by Nelson Goodman that um, you know, for, Carnap uses this concept of topological dimension um, it's part of the construction there, and it's a very complicated mathematical concept, but it's, uh, um, at least Carnap takes it, that like the rest of mathematics, Russell has shown how it can be reduced just to logical symbols. 
So he uses this concept of topological dimension, and he says basically you could recognize the visual sense by the fact that visual space um, has five dimensions, two dimensions of the visible field and three dimensions of the color solid. If you didn't understand what I just said, never mind. <laughs> it's not that important. Uh, but uh, it, it, it turns out that the topological dimension of any finite set is zero. And since they're presumably, I mean, the, Carnap is not completely clear about this, but it seems like we always are working with a finite set of elementary latency so in the constructional system. So this, this concept of topological dis dimension won't work. It won't give the number five. It will always give the number zero. So it's a technical error, right? So like, I mean, one of the advantages and disadvantages of um, bringing philosophy so close to technical mathematical methods is that you can find a mistake like that. I already, you know, Russell's paradox is another example. It's definitely a mistake. It has to be fixed or else this whole system will collapse and it's not clear whether it could be fixed uh, since Carnap never tried to finish the system and ended up changing his mind about how to do things anyway. It's, you know, the problem has never been really looked into. But so there's, so, so that's one of the reasons why I say that the, all the details of the system are not that important. It doesn't even really work. And Carnap himself says, um, this is probably worth seeing in the book. Um, this is on page 246. Since the given constructional system is only a preliminary outline, we do not wish to base the following considerations upon details of this system, but only upon its character as a whole. Right, so the following considerations are all the philosophical morals of the book, right? Some problems of essence, the whole part where he starts talking about um, uh, how, how everything he's done limits philosophy and rules out metaphysics. Um, all of that, he says, is not based on the details of the system. He doesn't know that the details of the system literally don't work, but he knows very well that they're completely unfinished. They only go up basically to constructing an object, a, a class of elementar elebnisa that is supposed to contain the ones that have visual sensations in them. <laughs> and then it stops. <laughs> right? So it doesn't get anywhere close to... Um, going up to tables or, you know, um, uh, religions or anything like that. The beauty of statues. <laughs> it doesn't even get to um, the, con the com it doesn't even get very far in the construction of the auto-psychological realm. The contents of my own consciousness. Um, so, I mean, that's a sign, however, that, you know, uh, although Carnap is definitely interested in the details here, he wants to convince you that something like this is possible in principle. He even seems to want to convince you that something like this actually can be done someday, although it's hard to believe he really thinks that, you know, I mean, it would be so complicated. <laughs> but in any case, but, you know, independent of that, he, you know, he thinks that just like the orientation towards language, the orientation towards the future, as he puts it in the preface, that is manifest in this way of thinking about things is important even adv in advance of actually working out the details. Which is lucky for us because otherwise we would have to try to understand all those details, etc. <laughs> all right. So, um, um, okay, so what is important about this? 
Oh, actually, I see this is in my notes again, so I have another chance to talk about it. Here's okay, so page six. My printer is screwed up. All right. Um, right. So I'm going to go. I mean, I guess this is kind of, this is at least part of what I felt like I just had to skip at the end of the first book. You know, which is the question. So, um, I actually, so actually, let me mention something else before that. I'm sorry, this is very confusing. I haven't got out a single complete sentence for like five minutes. But, um, all right, so this is what I'm going to talk about first. So, um, um, so the like the general way the system is supposed to work, the thing that you're supposed to be able to see even from the mere outline, is that the system is going to. Um, reduce all the higher level objects by means of the method of indicators. And again, the indicators are going to be like, so, you know, suppose I have some long statement about a tree, like this tree has leaves shaped like this and uh, and it's a conifer, and the cones are shaped like this, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and suppose I'm willing to accept that as necessary and con sufficient conditions for this tree being a pine tree. I mean, everything depends on my will here, basically. And I think that's, in fact, really important to kind of but suppose I'm willing to accept that as a logical translation of the statement, this is a pine tree, right? I'm not willing necessarily to accept it as a translation in all respects. It's not epistemically equivalent to this is a pine tree, but I'm willing to accept that as that statement being true as necessary and sufficient condi conditions for this to be a pine tree. So again, and maybe, like, I don't know if everyone has been following what these symbols phi is supposed to be. But the point is that, like, phi x is supposed to be a symbol saying, like, put in some long description that contains x over and over again. So it might be, so for example, phi, like, phi is a syntactic variable. It stands for a statement, right? So phi might be, you know, X is a tree with needles and cones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then um, uh, saying that I'm willing to accept this as um, logically equivalent to X is a pine tree. And saying furthermore that this statement is something I know in advance of knowing that something is a pine tree, right? It's something that's capable of justifying it rather than the other way around. Is a way of saying that this statement gives indicators for being a pine tree. Or, I mean, that's what it means to say that this statement gives indicators for being a pine tree. This statement, again, this is nothing I didn't say before, but I'm saying it again in hopes that it might be clear this time, right, in a different context. This, this statement gives indicators for being a pine tree means, again, that this statement says something that's better known than pine tree-ness, that's known in advance of pine tree-ness, that is, that's more easily justified than, than the statement, this is a pine tree. And it's logically equivalent, it's necessary and sufficient for this to be true for the statement, this is a pine tree to be true. And if we write this is a pine tree like this, x is a member of pine, then pine is the higher level object we're constructing here. And we construct it by saying pine equals by definition the extension of this statement.
And then the general rule for eliminating the names of classes tells us that we can always replace this thing wherever it turns up with this. So that's how reduction works. And the only part of that that's, that's specific to this system, again, is the epistemic primacy. This has to be an epistemically primary statement relative to this. So what this means is, why am I going through this all again now? What this means is that um, um, and this is one of the fictitious languages, or this is one of the languages of the const constructional system, the language of fictitious constructions. This means that um, if I have a bunch of things that, are, that I say about pines, I mean, they, some of them might be false, right? But they're all meaningful things that I say about pines. Um, then... Uh, Number one, I can get rid of the term pine by transforming it into a statement where the term pine only occurs in the context X is a pine. That's the basic state of affairs with respect to the class pine, right? So I can, I can do that. And then I can get rid of the term pine by substituting this description, the description in terms of indicators. And then I can understand that as a, telling me a method for telling whether this statement is true or not. Right? I've got it translated into a statement that only mentions the indicators. So in principle, you know, like if someone said uh, there are an average of 10 pines per acre in, you know, Alameda County or I don't know, whatever, that's probably wildly wrong, but I just take that as an example, they're an average of 10 pines per acre in Alameda County, then um, uh, this gives me instructions for telling if it's true or not. What do I do? I look at every tree in Alameda County, and I inspect it for those indicators. And if it has them, I put them in the pine class. And if it doesn't, I put them in the not pine class. And then when I'm done, I see divide by the number of acres and I can tell whether the statement is true or not. So as you can tell, even that from that example though, this is, these, are, these are in principle instructions for telling if a statement is true. They aren't necessarily instructions you could actually follow. Right? Like, by the time I look at every single pine in Alameda County and examine it for all these indicators, probably a new pine will have grown, <laughs> right? Like this task is probably actually impossible. <laughs> um, and that's only when we've only done this one level of reduction, right? We didn't redu reduce it to the elementary Leibniz set, to the basic experiences. We just reduced it from statements about pine trees to statements about trees and needles and cones and stuff, right? Imagine if we had the whole thing written out as a giant statement about which of my basic experiences do I remember as being similar to which. The task of telling how many pines there are in Alameda County will turn out to be a task for finding out whether that relation of remembered similarity between my basic experiences has some really complicated property. Right? I mean, similar to the property it has of being not a symmetric relation, right? But much, much more complicated some kind of general property about what types of ordered pairs it holds between and what it doesn't. That's what I'm, my task of counting the pines in Alameda County will turn out to be a task of examining every one of my basic experiences and finding out whether the relationship of remembered similarity between them has a certain character or not. Well, again, so the, so the language of fictitious constructional operations is 
describes the levels of construction that way as instructions for doing that, basically. But it should be clear immediately that if it weren't already clear in the first pine example, that in the second example, we're talking about something you can't actually do. It's, it's a fiction. First of all, I can't actually do it because not all my basic experiences are in yet. Right, so one of the fictions of the language of fictitious constructional operations is that basically I'm doing this after I'm dead. <laughs> Right, that all my my basic experiences are in, and now I'm starting to examine how they're related to each other. <laughs> there won't be any more. Um, um, this actually, I think this isn't just a pun or something. I think not by coincidence. I think this is related to what Heidegger calls being towards death. <laughs> um, and why that turns out to be so important in being in time. But uh, fortunately for you, this course is not about the relationship between Heidegger and Carnap. So going back to the fictions of the fictional, the language of fictitious constructional operations, it's also not the case that um, I can really, even the basic experiences I've had so far, that I can actually lay them all out of the list and examine how they're related to each other. Right? These basic experiences are very fleeting things. You know, uh, um, I'm really usually not even aware of them because, as Carnap says, what I'm usually aware of are these higher level things that are just abstractions from me. Um, and not, it, I mean, at most, usually what I'm aware of is things like tables and pine trees and houses and people, right? So, like, I'm usually I'm usually not even paying attention to these basic experiences. Um, and even if I try to, I can't remember very many of them at a time. I can't be sure I'm thinking about the same one again when I go back to it. So this this task of... This would be the task of verification. And the term verificationism means the view that all our meaningful sentences or all the sentences of science can in principle be verified. And at least the strict sense of verificationism is can be verified in this very strict way, meaning that if I had the list of all my basic experiences or whatever we take to be the fundamental given and knew how they related to each other, I could tell for sure whether every meaningful sentence is true or false. I could resolve that issue. Um, but so... Carnap at this stage is a verificationist and a very strict kind of verificationist. But you have to notice that, and this is important to understand what happens later, it's already true at this stage that actually doing the verification is not possible. So whenever I say something like there's a table there, it's not based on actually carrying out this process. So what makes it meaningful and rational can't be that I actually carried out this process or that I could actually in real life carry out this process. It's just what makes it rational and meaningful to say that is this in principle verifiability. And a consequence of that is going to be that later on when Carnap relaxes this requirement of verifiability, he's not going to think it's a big deal. Right, it will turn out that, yeah, you can't tell 100% for sure whether every statement is true or false, even if you had all of your experience. You can only build up evidence for or against it or something like that. But that's all we could really do anyway, right? That is, it was always admitted to begin with that, that you know, all I have um, in terms of this very fundamental kind of justification, but actually even in terms of less fundamental times of, kinds of ger ger verification, all I normally have is a certain amount of evidence based on the indicators 
for what I'm saying. And I don't usually have the full um, statement that the base, you know, involving the indicators that the constructional system would require to be logically equivalent to what I want to say. Right. So, for example, in the case of the number of pine trees in Alameda County, you know, I would probably do something like figure out pretty much what a pine tree looks like from a satellite photo. You know, I actually probably train a computer to recognize them in a satellite photo, you know, and get it to count them. <laughs> right. And, you know, uh, that's very far. Something could look like that from above without really being a pine tree. Right, like maybe it's a telephone pole with the top of a pine tree taped to the top of the telephone pole, <laughs> right? So it's not really a pine tree and a careful inspection would show it's not. But, you know, nevertheless, that thing I've done is, you know, does have some reference to the indicators. Like I started with something I knew was a pine tree based on the indicators, saw what it looked like in the, in the satellite photo, et cetera. Right. So it does ultimately involve a certain amount of evidence based on the indicators and the indicators are what allow me to build up evidence for or against something. That's all I really had anyway. And so once we start saying, well, even in principle, you couldn't have more than that. Carnap doesn't think it's the end of the world. OK. Other questions about that? Okay, so um, there's one other thing I want to talk about. Um, which is um, which is one of the few sections of construct of the constructional system that I did assign you to read. It's um, sections 126 through 28, I guess. Um, and it's about the introduction of the thing world, right? So the way the system works is that we start with the auto psychological. Maybe I should put this at the bottom rather than the top, but Start with the auto psychological, and then the first thing I construct after that um, is the thing world or the world of physical things. And then after that, I construct the world of physics. This is super confusing. Shouldn't the world of physical things be the world of physics? And the answer is that um, in German, he doesn't call them physical things. He just calls them things, Dinger. There's a reason why the translator didn't want to go with thing as the translation. And it, in English, we use the word thing kind of almost as a pronoun, right? Like you say, a red thing. And when you want to talk about all, you say everything. So it's hard to use thing as the name of a specific type. In fact, what we would say is a specific type of thing, right? <laughs> so I'm going to say, no, thing isn't a specific type of thing. Everything is a thing, right? So that's all English. In German, the word ding is not used that way. So you would say something more like every is a thing rather than everything is a thing. Um, and you would say something more like a red rather than a red thing, right? So anyway... That's just, uh, that's why this is a little confusing, but these are not the same thing. <laughs> anyway, we're not reading this part, so it's not that important. 
the thing world or the world of physical things is the world of um, perceivable bodies, basically. Right, so as opposed to the world described by physics, which consists of mathematical quantities distributed in space-time or something like that, this is the world that consists of bodies that have colors and uh, all kinds of other sensible properties. Um, now, so why did I ask you to read this part? And I can see that I'm running, I'm close to running out of time. I mean, it's like, whatever, eight more minutes. So I'm probably not gonna get into all the interesting details of how this works, but I'll say, well, so this is the way Carnap describes it. He describes it once in section 126 in a more rigorous way. So, so the way he describes it in section 126, he doesn't use the logistic symbolism Unfortunately, it might have helped with this if he had brought in at least a little bit. But instead, it seems like he's using the language of fictitious constructional operations. Right? He says what to do, assign a color point to a certain point in space, etc. And then in section 127, he re-describes it using the realistic language, that is um, saying what we would ordinarily say about physical things that makes this constructional procedure the right one to construct them, basically. So what is the procedure he describes in section 126? Well, he says, we want to set up a system of space-time points. It's going to have one temporal dimension and n spatial dimensions. What An n will be as small as we can make it. He says, so in fact, maybe actually, I guess he calls n the total number. So it's going to have n minus one spatial dimensions. So he says, in fact, n, the, the smallest we can make it is three. That's an empirical fact, he says, about my experiences. So, uh, so it's going to be a four-dimensional system. It's going to be a system of points in a four-dimensional mathematical space. And um, it's going to have the following characteristics. Number one, there's going to be a certain class of points that I call the viewpoints. So like if this is space and this is time, this other part is R, right? So there's, the viewpoints are going to lie on a certain curve that, um, right, at, at every time there's going to be a single viewpoint and the viewpoint is going to move continuously. He doesn't mention a direction that I'm looking at each time. But, um, or actually, maybe he does say that. I don't remember. I guess he does say that. So at each time there's also going to be a direction that I'm looking. And based on an object that was constructed in the auto-psychological realm, namely the visual field at every time of my life, I'm going to assign, first of all, I'm going to assign a certain elementary experience to each one of these points. And I'm going to, based on the visual field that's abstracted from that elementary experience, I'm going to assign color points in the direction I'm looking, I guess I should. This is like a plane, right? And I'm looking out because everything I'm looking at is at the same time, <laughs> but in different places. Actually, he says in real life, it's not a plane, it's a cone because the speed of light is finite. But, you know, forget that. It's just confusing. So it's, um, think of this as a plane. Right? I'm looking out in different directions at the same time. And based on the visual field, I'm going to assign color points to things, to, to points in the direction I'm looking, to the points I can see from my viewpoint. Right? I'm, I just slipped in stuff in the realistic language. Right? That's what this is supposed to turn out to mean. So that 
Right, so the, so the constructional operation is I'm going to try to assign, I'm going to try to assign a visual field to each one of these viewpoints um, and assign um, color points in directions that are visible from that viewpoint such that, and then he gives a list of criteria, but a lot of the criteria are like as well as possible criteria. Right, like as well as possible, I want the the color that's visible that's in the visible field at that time in that direction is going to correspond to the color I assign to a point out there in space. As far as possible, um, the colors of points are going to change continuously. Then, as I move along in time. As far as possible, you know, the um, it's going to be. I'm going to be able to assign. I'm going to be able to assign, to connect points at one time to points at another time where they haven't moved that far from each other, um, such that the color is continuous between them. Right, and all of this is a way of saying that as far as possible, I'm going to assign. Um, uh, colors to outside points such that like with the minimum possible discontinuities and jerkiness um, those colors are going to describe a world that I can see from this point of view as time goes on. That's the idea. Um, this obviously is an extremely important step in the system. It's just better work or else the whole thing's not worth much. Um, the thing that's weird about it is uh, it's not clear how this could be turned into a constructional definition of, for example, uh, um, you know, the class red point or visible red point. Right, we wanna know, what we ought to be able to say is, like, P is a member of the class of visible red points. Well, actually, no, so, um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't put yeah. P is a visible red point. It's going to be somehow reduced to some statement about points. Um, so we want to be able to eliminate this is well. This is the whole point. It doesn't, sorry, this is the whole problem. It doesn't look the right way at all, right? We have statements like P is a member of the class of points in space time, P is a member of the class of viewpoints, P is a member of the class of visible red points. And we want to reduce them, we want to get rid of these statements in in favor of statements about my experiences. But um, these propositional functions don't take that type of variable at all. <laughs> They're all about points. How can we eliminate that? So, I mean, the reason, ooh, I've gone over time, sorry. So I'll just say, the reason I've introduced this is because um, Quine in epistemology naturalizes in the claim, we can't get rid of that. And so the system actually breaks completely at this stage. It's not something that could be fixed.
right? Carnap has not given an outline here of something that could in principle be translated into the logistic language. And that's why Quine is gonna say the whole project of logical positivism fails. And that's all in two minutes more than I have time to say. So I will see you on Thursday. Bye.